calling from the Trib. I'd like to confirm. Hey, I've been getting the run around for two hours. I'm well, coming up. Tell me approximately how much money was... Where do you have them done? Uh, they just kind of happen. <laughs> Ooh, I can tell a lot about a guy in a first date by the kind of car he drives. And I think a bit of like you. Great wheels. Yeah. That's mine. It's okay. It's open. Great sound system. Vehicle fire. Oh, Eight thank you, so you're a little off the station. Oh, these are scanners. Oh, great. Well, what are we going to do? You like this, Scott? Wait, wait, wait a second. I got something better. First, we're going to a fire. Oh, that's cool. got to play more. Yeah. Is that the punishment for playing good? It's a great game for working out the frustrations of the job, isn't it? Frank, I go on my job to work out the frustrations of trying to learn this game. How do you handle it when the pressure's built up and you just feel like yelling at the people who work for you? I yell at the people who work for me. It's very healthy. Excuse me, my beeper. Do you always have that thing go off when your opponent makes a great return? You'd have heard it before if you ever returned one. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Lou, I gotta go. You a doctor? No, fireman. You make house calls? Only if they're burning. Actually, I work out of the Newton Fire Marshal's office. I investigate arson. I'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bear with me here. I, I gotta get this film back to the paper. Okay, and then we better get you to your place so you can get all those wet clothes. Oh, I don't need to change. Let's go anyway. What about the disco? Forget the disco. Mrs. Pinto, something wrong? Good morning, Mr. Grant. Why must your mind work that way? Just because I drop by my city room doesn't mean something dreadful has happened. Good morning, Miss Pinto. Hello, what's wrong? This fire story caught my eye. Oh, that, that was just a routine fire. Animal was in the neighborhood. He got some good art, so we ran the picture. Well, the reason I'm down here is because that picture is of a building I've spent a great deal of time in. Oh, not recently, of course. When I was a little girl, that building was in a very fashionable section. My father built it. Mm. Too bad I had to go like that. Well, it's not just the personal memories that make it seem such a loss. The architects the pioneers of that era. Uh, before everything in Southern California became stucco and glitter. Precisely. Now, I know you gentlemen have your priorities, but could you send a reporter by as a sort of follow-up to see if the building was burned beyond repair or if they're going to be able to salvage it? I'll put someone on it right away. Thank you. Have a good day. Oh, and Mrs. Pinchon, stop by any time. Wrong. Nothing. Billy! Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. Can this building be saved? Can be? Yes. Will be? No. This building isn't dead yet, but the disease it's got is terminal. I don't understand. Okay. There's enough of the basic structure left to rebuild, but it won't happen. This fire is just part of a pattern of decline. The next phase is the looters. Within the next days and weeks, they'll strip the burned out apartments of the plumbing, pipes, snobs, sinks, bathtubs, toilets, you name it. Can't the police stop them? You mean post a 24-hour guard on every burned down building in the city? It will take an army. So what happens? Eventually, it'll be torn down. The fire moved pretty fast through here. You can tell by the glazed alligator burn pattern. Where did the fire start? The basement where the deepest char is. Then it moved up the stairwell. The fire moves up. Was it arson? Well, most arson fires are pretty obvious. Flammable liquids, for example, leave a pattern. I don't see that here, but of course you've got a neighborhood here with uh, junkies and old folks and uh, homosexuals and poor people. All people who obviously uh, like to set fire to the places where they live. I'm just saying that there's a lot of carelessness and indifference. Al, let me help you with that. Look, miss, I'm kind of busy right now, so uh, if you need something else, you can catch me later, or you can talk to my boss, Frank Durning. He's the guy who assigned me to this. Because I'm telling you, I know what started this fire. Somebody said it on purpose. How do you know? God, somebody called me last night and told me to get out of the building. So I know this wasn't an act of God. If God wanted to warn people, he wouldn't use the telephone, huh? Do you have any idea who it was? Who wants to know? My name's Billy Newman. I work for the Tribune. Yeah? Well, I might know some names. Well, I can't say them. Look, I got children to think about. What's your name? That don't make no difference either. That woman thinks somebody started the fire. It even sounds like she might know who did it. Sure, because it was probably her. I'm kidding. I'll talk to her. Five to ten, she won't talk to me. Remember Eddie Redfield back in Michigan? Sure, the Detroit Dynamo. Sports writer on the free press. Gone, heart attack. That's why you shouldn't read trade journals, Charlie. It'll only depress you. Oh, here's another one. This'll really get you. No, Charlie. Larry Abel. Jeez. Dumb, good-looking Larry Abel. Too bad. Not dead. Went into broadcasting, became an anchorman back east. Makes six figures a year. That's awful. I may have something. Talk about depressing. What'd I say? Nothing, Billy. 
You just picked the wrong time to come in here brimming with youthful enthusiasm. What can we do for you? Well, first of all, you can forget about Mrs. Pinchon's building. It's had it. Too bad. Yes, but while I was driving around the area, I saw several other sites of burned buildings, so I did some checking. There have been 12 apartment house fires in that area of Newton in the last 19 months. Is that a lot? A major fire every six weeks. Seems I hear sirens all the time. It's five times the average for other communities in this area. What caused the fires? Most of them are listed as accidental. For the others, they avoid the word arson. Uh, rubbish in the building ignited by unauthorized person or persons unknown. In other words, arson. No, no, they're not saying that. A passing vagrant could have tossed a lighted cigarette in the rubbish. So it's negligence. It's not an intentional crime. I've got this strange instinct that tells me you don't buy that. A woman at the fire told me that she's positive that it was lighted on purpose. When I started asking her questions, she backed off fast. So what have we got here? Possible arson epidemic. No facts, only Billy's suspicion. And youthful enthusiasm. I'd like to try to find a source in Newton. It could take some time. Well, isn't there somebody on the paper who already knows someone there? There is. Who? Oh. Me. I know a guy in the fire department, in fact. I don't know him well. I'll talk to him. You may work a source yourself. Why not? I'm the one he knows. Maybe he won't talk to anyone else. Maybe he won't talk to me. Now, now don't push in the beginning. Okay, Billy. He may not give you too much at first. You have to be kind of patient. Billy, I covered beats for 16 years. I think I can handle the source. Right, sure, of course. You'll do fine. If you need anything... Billy! Right. Right. Okay, great. Oh, that was better than last time, huh? Yeah, 35 minutes and your beeper hasn't gone off yet. That doesn't happen so often. What is it you do then? Investigate fires for arson? My men do. Arson is pretty hard to prove, I guess, huh? Uh, it's a misconception. <clears throat> arson isn't hard to prove. It's just hard to pin on somebody. Uh, you have to catch the guy running from the scene with a smoking match. <laughs> Not quite that bad. It's just that our caseload is so heavy and... People somehow don't realize what a vicious crime arson is. If I used the word killer, that would make people take notice. You're a newsman. You know what fire does to people. People die in fires. Firemen, kids. Even with a man who uses a gun, the destruction is, is limited. It's fairly known. The guy who puts a mask to a building, he could be unleashing the Holocaust. And to me, there isn't a worse soul on earth than someone who would do that. shouldn't get me going. I'm not rational on the subject. I think it makes a lot of sense. In fact, maybe you could help me out with something. The Tribune is following up on last night's fire in Newton. One of our reporters has this crazy feeling that all the burned out buildings in the area might be part of a pattern. Why is that crazy? Like a pattern of arson. We checked the reports. The fires are listed as accidental. Yeah. Where do we go from there? Check again. Look at the ownership of the building. Look for names. What are you saying, Frank? What's the story? Uh-uh. Your newspaper's gonna have to do this on its own. Oh, come on. We'll I see where you go with that. It's gotta be my way, Lou. I've got my reasons. Okay. I think it's your sir. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on A and E. Oh, I need a cup of coffee. Oh, bye. After digging around the Hall of Records for three days, I feel all dry and dusty. You find anything? Yeah. The information we got from your source didn't exactly point us to it. Officially, they're not calling it arson. I know. But I did find out something. The name of the Wheeler dealer who owns the burned-out building. Who? Ella Schmidt. She sounds like a high-powered speculator. What makes you think so? Well, for one thing, she sold and rebought the building three times in the last year and a half, each time for more money. I've got her address. It's somewhere in the Wilshire Center District. Why don't you pay her a visit? On my way. Uh, 
Is Miss Schmidt in? Uh, Mrs. Schmidt, yes, I am. Do you own a building at 1520 Dayton in Newton? Yes. Well, I wanted to talk to you about it. My name is Billy Newman of the Tribune. Oh. Well, well come in. Would you care for a cup of tea? I just made some. The real kind, not with the bag. That would be nice. And it's still piping hot. Tea must be hot, mustn't it? Yes. Here you are. Thank you. I guess the insurance will cover the damage from the fire. Yes, the insurance. Who is your insurance carrier? Oh, well, if you really want to speak about the building, you'll have to ask my lawyer. I have his card somewhere. Yeah? He handles all the, uh, the business aspects. Yes, here it is. Mason Cunningham. Yes, I am the attorney for Mrs. Schmidt and Adventure. I wanted to ask you a few questions about... Let me interrupt you for a moment, Miss Newman. You're talking about a private business here. And I don't have to comment, and I won't comment now. Uh, please don't take that personally. But I've been doing this long enough to know that the press always manages to distort what you say, and then I regret the time that I've spent. I know you're busy, but... That's right. I am busy. I'm sorry. Goodbye. So we dug around, we found this tycoon who owns the building, only Grandma Walton is playing a part. So we got to this lawyer Cunningham, and he's Stonewall. It's a dead end. He's checking ownership. How we did that? Look at the other burnt buildings, look for names. What are we going to find? Whatever you find. Uh, come on, Frank, this is frustrating. It's not fair to have us roving in the dark if you know something. Do you know something? Nothing I can give you, Lou. I have my suspicions, but I do know you're not groping in the dark. You're just going to have to make these painful steps yourself in order to build a case. Build a case? I thought that's what you were supposed to do. I'm trying to. You don't know my problems. I uh, think I'm trying to help you with your problems. You can. Through the trip. You make people more aware. A little public indignation can help. But where are we going? Fire moves up. Starts at the bottom and moves up. That's what you're gonna have to do. Each card is a burned out building in Newton. Is there a pattern here? Do they all have three sixes in the address or something? If there's a pattern, I don't see it. What about this owner, George Kelly? I see his name in a couple places here. Is that a pattern? I don't know. It's getting really complicated. I could use another mind on this. Good idea. Rossi. Not that mind. George Kelly? Not me. Are you George Kelly? Uh, no, I think I saw George going over there. Thanks. Hey, I'm looking for George Kelly. I'm Kelly. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a man who owns a building in Newton. It was burned in a fire a few months ago. Yeah? So I found him. What is it you want? Just to ask a few questions. Can I give you a hand with that? No. Well, I'll just walk along with you then. You can walk along, but if you want to talk about the building, you better call my lawyer. Uh, and what is his name, sir? Mason Cunningham. Good ride, Mr. Davis. Thank you, George. Cunningham. Step aside. Arlo Carp. They said you were from the Tribune. You wanted to talk to me. I just have a feeling you're not the food editor. That's right. Good. Then I won't have to lie. I wanted to talk to you about a building. It had a fire about six months ago, and you're listed as the owner. Out in Newton. That's right. Yeah, terrible. Terrible fire. The whole thing went. 
But the insurance paid for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. But look, I, uh, I, I don't involve myself in the day-to-day -day running of the property. Uh, I'm much too busy working on my career. You want to know more, you just talk to my lawyer, Mason Cunningham. You know him? Not real well. Great guy. Say, you had lunch. I'll fix something special. Uh, no thanks. I'm kind of short on time. Hey, I understand. I don't need to hear myself. Hey, hey, no admittance. Sorry, Joe. I'll take that. Boy, security's really a joke around here. We've got to run a tighter ship. Relax, Rossi. We haven't broken the enemy code here. So far, all we've got is a bunch of names, dates, and addresses which don't add up to anything. Okay, one more time. Each of these 12 cards represents 12 buildings, all in Newton, all of which have had a fire in the last 19 months. And all of which are owned by Ella Schmidt, the house, Frau, George Kelly, the stable boy, Arlo Carp, the fry cook. Mm. That's what's great about this country. Anybody can be an entrepreneur. We don't have squires and landed gentry. No, but we do have a few robber barons. I've got a little clue. Why don't you write it on a piece of paper and fold it up so we can all have fun guessing what it is? Howard Davis. Anybody we know? Nope. He just happens to be one of the major partners in the Claremont Riding Stables, where Kelly is the groom. He owns the diner in Santa Monica, where Orlo Karp works. And Ella Schmidt, it turns out, is his mother-in-law. Howard Davis. You call this evidence against Howard Davis? To me, it looks like the case history of an unlucky man. Unlucky? The man's a Job. Only Job wasn't insured for twice the assessed value of his property. I'm talking about a dozen fires here. How can that be coincidence? Well, Davis has interests all over the city. In this neighborhood, he's been hit by a lot of fires, sure. But he's also been the first and the loudest to complain. Hey, Dave, want to go to lunch? Oh, I guess you don't. Billy Newman of the Tribune, Frank Derny. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Let me show you something. Reports by Howard Davis on small fires. Complaints about vandalism and negligence in the neighborhood. He was covering himself. Listen. You're talking about one of the roughest areas in the city. That place is a fireman's nightmare. Those 50-year-old wooden structures are fire traps, and the people that live in there don't exactly have pride of ownership. If investments in that area are so unappealing, why does a smart man like Davis keep his money there? Good point. Most of the city's businessmen have pulled their money out of the area and left it to deteriorate. Davis has hung in. I don't think that's something you criticize a guy for. Oh, I'm going to do more than criticize. I think we've got some pretty good evidence. All you've done is level a lot of vague charges against a respected business leader. Arson is a tricky business, Miss Newman. Why don't you leave its investigation to the professionals? Continue in a moment here on A and E. You find pain amusing, Donovan? Not on most people, but you managed to bring it off. Yeah. I don't know. In the old days, it took brains and guts to sweat a sores, but it didn't make you all sore like this. Because in the old days, you were younger. Because in the old days, we met in bars. City desk. 
Yeah, Frank. I'm terrific. Uh, no, no, that's not going too well. In fact, it's sort of dead-ended. At lunchtime today? No, uh, no, it's just that I thought you might be a little tired. Of course I'll be there. Yeah. Can we meet in a jacuzzi? here faster than I thought you would. Look, Frank, we thought we were making good progress on the story. But well, we bring our evidence to the fire department and they turn us off. I'm not surprised. You're not surprised? Well, I was surprised. Maybe I wouldn't be if you tell me a little bit more about what's going on. Look, Lou. Why aren't you in shorts? Because I didn't come to play. I hope to catch you in the locker room. Listen, Lou, we don't have much time. There's a report in here. It's the results of the fire department investigation into the arson problem. Frank, we know about the arson problem. I don't need to read a report. I need to know why, when we try to investigate arson in Newton, we run into a brick wall. That's what this report is about. It's an internal investigation that's been going on since January. It might have some of the answers you've been looking for. Why are you telling me this? You'll find out. You mean you've been sitting on all this since January? Look, Lou, the report just came out. The only reason you're getting it is because my department let me down. I'm really disturbed by what's in this report. Now, why don't you just read it instead of standing here growling at somebody who's trying to help you? I'll, I'll read it as soon... I'll read it as soon as I can. Better make it fast. I had to sneak it out. It's got to go back with me at the end of the lunch hour. How long is the report? 400 pages. Oh. the coffee boys off to lunch forgot your pants Rossi, billy what's that don't ask questions just do what i tell you we have to make copies of this use the machine in mrs pinchon's office and the one in sports billy we have to use the machines in advertising we have 40 minutes no 38 minutes let's go what is it i think it's Lou's memoirs i hope i get the war years We're finished. We just need the back cover to this volume. I gave it to you. I don't have it. We looked all around both machines. I'm finished. So am I. Let's just get that cover. It's got to be down here. I gave it to you, Rossi. Come on. It'll be here. Don't worry. It has it better to be, be Rossi. It has to be. Uh, oh, face it. It's just not here. I can't turn the report back without that cover. You found it. Not exactly. I found this in the library. Aren't they going to be a little suspicious when we give it back with the title of Bull Weevil Problem in the Central Valley? Not if we use the back cover. The color's close. Not really. Rossi! Well, if the light doesn't hit it. Well, you three start reading the report. i got to get this back. He goes and plays ball. We have to stay home and do homework. Okay, now you've, you've each read different parts of the report. You compared notes. Now what's the verdict? Mario Puzo has nothing to worry about. A man isn't asking for a literary opinion, Rossi. Apparently there was an arson for profit ring operating in Newton. Arson for profit? Sure. It works like this. All these buildings in a dying neighborhood get sold and resold back and forth. For example, I buy them cheap, I sell them to Rossi, he sells them back to me. We use dummy owners to disguise what's going on. I use my mother-in-law, she uses her maid. So the value of the property keeps going up. 60000 80000 150000 The bank gives me a loan to make the purchase, and the place is insured for its new market value. Then, mysteriously, there's a fire. The insurance is paid off with a profit of like $90,000, which the two of us split. 
Why do the insurance companies pay off? I can answer that one. See, in this state, there's a law that if the company doesn't pay off in 90 days, they have to pay a fine for bad faith. And the insurance company doesn't lose because the cost is passed on to all of us in higher premiums. Here's the real kicker. The ring was paying off two high officials in the arson division of the fire department. That's why Frank wasn't in a position to tell us more. And two men who were on the take were retired by the department, had the full pension. The conclusion of the report is that the bad apples are gone. Yeah, for now. What about your Howard Davis? Well, he's mentioned in the report, along with some of his friends. Now, they suspect him. The investigation's continuing. So, what we have had handed us is a cover-up in the Newton Fire Department. Mr. Grant, I understand this material came from a source of yours. It's not a bad piece of work. Thank you. What do you say, Mrs. Pinchon? Do we publish? By all means, publish. Don't forget that. Good morning, Chuck. Hi, Adam. Good digging on that arson ring, Lou. Ever want to swing over at Financial? I'll find a spot for you. Are you kidding? I'll never give me up. <laughs> what a great feeling, huh, Donovan? The whole city room gets turned on when we break a story like this. I think everyone feels proud. I feel proud. You did a good job. Want me to send you out on another story? Congratulations. You did all right. <laughs> what can I do for you, Billy? I located another Howard Davis building in the name of his secretary, same section of Newton. Okay, okay, this is good. And this means we have a potential fire here in six or eight months if it follows pattern. Here's the address. 1812 Dayton. 1812. This sounds familiar. Isn't that a war you fought in? <laughs> Good work, Billy. Morning, Chief. Well, if you've read the Tribune, just been going over it. For clues as to who the fake was. I haven't found any. Well, something caught my eye. They say in that paper that the investigation started last January. And yet, it's kind of odd because I really didn't get the go-ahead until late March. Well, I told you about an investigation in January, I believe. January? I don't know. Could be. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure either, Frank. That's why I had all eight copies of the report called. And? Well, this one's interesting. You know, we've been waiting three years for a Xerox machine. Time we've had to make do with that old mimeograph machine. And yet, Frank, five pages of this report is Xerox, like somebody copied it. Maybe somebody at the trip. But there's this, the back cover. Just a slightly different color from the rest. All in all, I'd say that this copy of the report did a little bit of traveling. This is your copy of the report, Frank. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on A and Hey, what's good here? The scotch. Two scotches. How is it over there, Frank? Yeah, we don't have to talk about that. Did you watch the game last night? Yeah, pretty good game. Was a good game. Yeah. Look, Frank, we're following this thing up with stories every day. Yeah, I read the papers. And the public's starting to respond. We're getting letters. There's talk of a task force reorganizing your department. On the L.A. model. Right, talk, no action. Oh, no, it's good, Lou. It's good. I'm sure people are more aware. You getting a lot of heat? <laughs> no. No, more like ice. Getting the old freeze treatment. Nobody said a word to me in a week. I've become like a piece of furniture, a desk or a chair. You know, it's not so bad. I miss a lot of lousy jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like a great work environment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is, uh, it's not just work. 
Yeah, they don't call it home. Makes it rough on Sheila. Most of our friends were with the department. Other kids, they know something's wrong, but they don't understand what. How can they? Tell you, Lou, I don't know how much longer I can stick it out. I feel like I did this to you. Oh, no, no, you didn't do it. Come on! Huh. I thought you said the scotch was good here. Bloody Mary. Hot. Extra hot. Why don't you uh, sit over there? I'll send it over to you. Sure. did good work. Top of the line. That's why my prices are top of the line. I didn't come here looking for bargains. That's a good start. Want to tell me about it? Okay. There's this, uh, this guy who owns a restaurant. He took all his savings and decided to give L.A. a better hamburger. He, he opened a place in a good location in the financial district, but then they started tearing up the street in front of his place. Stayed torn up for months. The place never got off the ground. So, uh, so this owner is running in the red. He doesn't know how he's going to pay back his creditors. The world dealt him some bad cards. Maybe, uh, could deal him a stroke of luck so he could get well. A little, uh, spontaneous combustion, maybe? After hours. After hours when the place is deserted. Nobody should get hurt. Sounds doable. This uh, owner is in kind of a hurry. Look, I'm busy tonight. I don't like jobs to come too close together. Maybe we'll talk in a week. Come on, Lou. You can't let this affect your work. I'm not letting it affect my work. Letting it affect my lunch. You know, if I were in your place, you'd be telling me how that's all just part of being a journalist. How Frank knew the risks he was taking, and most of all, how important the story was. That the welfare of the community was better served because the Tribune was able to print the truth. I'd say all that. But better. Would I be saying it to cheer you up? Or would I mean it? It wouldn't matter. Oh, oh that's beautiful. I uh, exposed for the swan. Let the background wash out. Oh, look at the exhaustion on that poor man's face. Because <laughs> he's been through a battle. That picture says war better than any action shot. Was it Vietnam? Pasadena. That guy was the lead in a porno movie on his break. He was not. Hello. Get your butt out of that building. I'm telling you now. Who is this? Donovan? I mean it now. Hey. What was that? <sighs> Some weirdo. Nobody complains. That lasagna smells like it's burning. Mm, another half hour. You're just hungry. Debbie, turn the oven off. I think the building's on fire. That's what that call was. Come on, come on, let's go. Come on. What about the other apartments? You just get out. I'll knock on the door. Oh, Get out! 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 Get out!
Venom, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. How come you're here? The light man got the report on the fire. When he checked the address, he realized it was your building. Then he called me, and I brought a friend. Another building owned by Howard Davis. Oh, somebody named Fisher owns the building. Marlene Fisher. Yeah. Davis' is secretary. I know Lou. Lou? One of the guys in my building, Mr. Norman. You didn't make it out. Say you're the one that gave the fire department report to the newspapers. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, well, my name's Mike Carlson. You don't know me, but I just want to tell you something. The guy's in the line. I've been talking a lot about you. Really appreciate what you did. Thank you. gotten better if that's possible <laughs> i get a lot more practice now i don't go to lunch with the guys in the office anymore so i come here still that bad huh yeah to them i'm a traitor frank the the city comes up a winner because you've got an arson task force i look great because the trip dug up a big story all the bad parts happen to you if i had to do it over again i'd do the same thing i think you're not exactly making me feel better I don't have to make you feel better. The task force is beginning, but Howard Davis and guys like him are still out there. You've got to keep working on that story. You can count on it. And Frank, I want you to know that you're served. This is Mike Wallace. Pope John Paul II, a moral authority or a master politician, the crisis in the Catholic Church on an all-new 20th century. Tonight, only on A&E. Now, U.S. and Mexican detectives join forces to break up an international drug smuggling ring. Join us for a police story, next on A&E. I'd like to confirm. Hey, I've been getting the run around for two hours. And I'm well, coming up. Well, can you tell me approximately how much money was missing? You're surrounded, Mr. Morgan. Now, you know we have to do this. I'd like to talk to you under better conditions. We can't help you this way. A good first step would be for you to let your family come out of there. Talk to me, Mr. Morgan. No, there's nothing changed. The guy's still in there. The shooting stopped now. I think the cops are hoping he'll cool down. How many people are in there? They don't know. They think two hostages. Well, stay back. I'm going to tell you what kind of gun he's got. Where's the animal? Oh, he's around someplace. I don't know. He said he wanted to get some closer shots. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! <laughs> okay, lady, just keep calm. What's happening now? Did you see that? They released the hostages. What about the guy? Is he giving himself up? <laughs> Apparently not. Oh, my God. What's the matter? Animal! What's going on? What's happening? Hold your fire! Hold your fire! Please. Get back here and keep your head down. Listen, this is an order. Get back here. Stop that camera and get back here. He's crazy. Mm, what talented. This isn't a grabber, I don't know what is. It's got to be better than anything anyone else has gotten. He risked his life to get that shot. Well, he shouldn't do that. No, no, that's crazy. 
But look at that picture. Lou, this isn't the first time. Well, this was a special situation. No, it wasn't. Remember last week that overturned tanker on the freeway that I copied? Do you know what he did? He just about hung by his heels from the freeway overpass to get that shot. Yeah, I remember. What's his name from the Times called? And his voice was dripping with envy. Made my day. Lou, he's never acted this way before. I mean, what's gotten into him? I don't know. I'll talk to him. Told you never to eat the tuna Newberg in the cafeteria. You okay? That's what I'm business for, so they can have a good time. You know him? Faces change. Usually there's four or five hanging around here. They don't look like they're hurting anyone. I'm hardly making it to begin with. People drive by. Maybe they want to stop in and have a soft drink or something. And they see these clowns shucking and jiving out there. I don't know what to do. Here's your change. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too. Hey, man. How you doing? What you know? Not much. Uh, I cleaned your windshield off. That ought to be worth something, don't you think? No, you didn't clean my windshield. You just spread the dust and the bugs around. Well, shoot, there's a little spot in the center there you can see through if you duck your head a little. Okay. What about a quarter? Or oh, would that insult you? Hey, money can't insult people. It's people that can insult money. I'm not sure what that means, but that in itself is worth something. I didn't think you'd open the door. Is there any reason why I shouldn't? Sure. Look, I was just walking around the neighborhood here, and I see this car out front with a beautiful, clean windshield, and I figured you lived here. Look, I came back to give you two bits. Keep it. Well, I've got a bit of a problem. I need more than two bits. Well, then you really do have a problem, because I can't give you any more. Well, I don't want you to give it to me. I want to earn it. Doing what? I don't know. How about if I mow your lawn? There's a gardener that comes with the house. The owner pays for it. He comes every Wednesday. Oh, how about if I clean your garage? None of that stuff's mine. The owner stores a whole bunch of junk in there. What about your car? Can I wash your car? I'm sorry. There's just... There's just nothing I have around here for you to do. It's not that I don't want to help you, but I just don't have anything for you to do. Yeah, right. You're the class of 46. I should have known. Donovan. Yeah, Lou. Does the class of 46 mean anything to you? It was a movie, wasn't it? No, it isn't a movie. You're thinking of something else. Forget it. Where's the photo with Simon Sheet? Where's the animal? At the zoo? Honestly, he and Billy are over there checking out those new birds from South America. I'll just bet you've been waiting all day to have someone ask you that. Ask you what? Ask him where the animal is. Okay. Where's the animal? Out on assignment. <laughs> Hey, 
They're just beautiful. We've tried to keep the setting as close as possible to their natural habitat. Basically a rainforest, same as you find in parts of Asia and South America. Would it be possible to take some pictures from inside? Animal, what do you think? Well, I suppose so. Go inside. That way we could get some terrific shots. I can get what we need from out here. He said it was all right. I say we don't need it. Well, hey, I think it would be more effective. Yeah, I don't care what you think. I've got what I was sent out to get. They're not going to run this anyway. Go on, then what? I don't know. He refused to talk about it. First, he's almost suicidal, taking chances. Then he acts scared of birds. I mean, he was actually sweating. Who is he now? He took off, dropped me downstairs, mumbled something about needing gas. I suppose he went to the garage. I just checked. He didn't go there. If he wasn't feeling well, maybe he went home. Did you try him at home? No. Wouldn't he have checked out with us? Give me his number. Continue in a moment here on A and E. Rossi. Morning, Luke. What's up? You're uh, pretty close to animal, aren't you? That depends. What's he done? I just wanted to ask you a question. Shoot. Does he ever take hallucinogenics? Are you kidding? He is an hallucinogenic. I'm serious. I don't know. I don't think so. Why don't you ask him? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Good answer, Wilson. Uh... Oh, yeah, he is. Animal. Who is it? Is it a woman? It's the lamp. You sure? No, you know how they are. They often lie. Am I your secretary? Yeah. Yeah, all three rolls. Push them two stops. Hey, Animal. Come into my office for a minute. Yeah, come on in. Close the door. How are you feeling? Is it working long hours? No, no. No more than usual. So what's with you on your phone? What do you mean? I called you at home last night. It rang and rang. I was just about to hang up when you answered and started hollering into it. Something about leaving you alone and about how it wasn't you, I, your I didn't fault. Know that and... was you. Well, who'd you think it was? Uh, nobody. I don't know. Oh. Does this phone business have anything to do with what happened at the zoo yesterday? What did happen at the zoo yesterday? Oh, with Billy. I just thought we had enough shots. Then what is it? You've been acting strange lately. I'm doing my job. I'm not talking about your job. I'm talking about you. Come on, Dennis. What is it? Okay. Uh, I've been having kind of a problem. Uh, 
It was okay for a while, and uh, then it started again. Can we talk about it? No, it's okay, yeah. I've been meaning to see somebody from the VA. I didn't know you were a vet. Vietnam. Yeah. Lou, I appreciate your worry, okay? I told you I have a problem. I told you I'm gonna see someone, and it'll all get straightened out. Look, I sure would like to help you. If there's anything I can Lou, do there's to... there's no way. You've got to believe that. I mean, uh, your class of 46, just too far away. Hey, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. DLA 51, that was some real fire. Nah, man, A51, you don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to jive us or something. Man. You don't know what a real firefight was if it came up to you and shook you personally by the hand. If I don't know what a firefight is, then would you kind of explain to me how come I happen to be carrying around 11 ounces of lead and steel in my hip? <laughs> uh, 11 ounces of uh, steel. Uh, hey, uh, uh, now you're both full of it. Now, where I was, that was real war. Oh. That, man. Hey, what, I you talk about firefighters. Yeah. We had an army. We had war, man. There was tanks coming at us. There were mortars coming at us. Boom, 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 everything. Boom, boom, there was everything. Yeah, yeah. Talk about uh, incoming. One day it was incoming, and the rain started, uh, and the drops couldn't even get down through it. Uh, we were dry as toast <laughs> underneath. Hey, hey, man, you got more stuff. Hey, 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 you got time, that. though, for that, man? Hey, man, you're not going to tell that not again. story again, are Yesterday you, you told the story. Are you going to drag your medals out again? <laughs> hey, the only way I'm going to bring that medal out is if I take a rocket, throw it through that pawn shop. Find man. the man of men. Yeah. Oh, shit. You got... I'd uh, like to talk to you a minute. <laughs> Can't you see I'm busy? Well, your secretary said it was okay to interrupt. What can I do for you, my man? Still want a job? You got jobs, mister? Just one. Yeah, I need a job. What you got in mind? I need some help with some plants. Uh, take you a couple of hours. Shoot. <laughs> I thought you meant a job. Uh, but I'll help you out. I got nothing else to do. Uh, my secretary calls. Tell her to take the afternoon off. Uh... <laughs> It's the secretary going through. Oh, man. What's your name? My name is Sutton. That's your last name? If you say Sutton, I'll turn around. What else do you need? Listen, you said something the other day that kind of intrigued me. Yeah? You said I was a part of the class of 46. What'd you mean? You were in the Army. Yeah. World War II. Yeah. So when was your outfit discharged? 1946. Class of 46, man. You guys had it made. What do you mean we had it made? Forget it. No, tell me. You tell me something. You remember what it was like when you came home from your war? Oh, boy, <laughs> do I. What a time we had. <laughs> we were nine days on a troop ship coming back from France. There was a poker game that we had started in disembarkation camps. There must have been nine million dollars changed hands on that boat. Huh? Nine days sleeping, eating poker. Huh? We blew off a lot of steam before we hit New York. And then, oh boy, I'll never forget that parade. We marched down Broadway and then Fifth Avenue. And for months, in any bar, as soon as they saw that ruptured duck on my lapel, I couldn't buy a drink. Nothing's too good for you, they'd say. Let me tell you about me. Tuesday, I was in a firefight. Tuesday night, I got orders, report home. My tour in Nam was over. Wednesday, I was on a helicopter. Thursday morning, on a jet from Tokyo to San Francisco. And I was still in uniform, and I was still dirty from being on the line, and I still had the sound of incoming in my ear. And I come off the plane and walk across that tarmac toward the building, toward the airport building, and went through the door. There's a crowd of people waiting for friends. And a man came out of the crowd, said I was a baby burner, and spit on me. What do you mean he spit on you? You mean spit? Yeah, that's what I mean. Just what I said. And you know something? Nobody did nothing. They looked away. A man called me a baby burner and spit on me, and they all looked away. 
I didn't know where I was. Maybe I still don't. Well, look, Sutton, uh, that, that was just the act of one man. Yeah, I thought that too for a while. But I don't figure you'd understand. Your war and my war, they were different. Aren't all wars the same? <laughs> Whatever you say, man. Okay. How was it different? It was just different. Sutton, I want to help you. I know that you do, man. I can see that you do. But there's no way that that's going to happen. And we both know it. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. What's up? Ah, oh, it's about the animal. The cops call. They're really steamed. The shootout? Yeah. Endangering the lives of hostages, interference with law officers in the performance of their duty, etc. You knew this was coming. I'm already on it. Listen, Charlie, something happened this weekend. You got him in? It's kind of related. Yeah, sure, shoot. You ever think of Vietnam? You mean the war? <coughs> Not if I can help it. I think there's a story there. Lou, we had the Vietnam War on the front page for over seven years. You really think there's something more to be said that hasn't already been chewed over? Well, yeah, we had the war on the front page, but I'm not talking about the war. I'm talking about the veterans. I don't think their story's been told. <sighs> the question occurs to me, is anyone interested anymore? Is that the question? Or is that the problem? Either way, it's a hell of a story. Who is it? Lou. Hi, Lou. Uh, this is a surprise. It wouldn't be if your phone was working. Can I come in? Yeah, come in. Uh, hmm. I have a new number. It's unlisted. Oh, terrific. Next time we need you at 1 in the morning to cover something hot, we'll send you a postcard. What'd you do, drop a camera? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I've been tinkering with a modification of the mirror system. Uh, something to drink? Are you, uh, you got any scotch? No, uh, I got some apple cider. The color's close. <laughs> Fine. Mm. Yours? Yeah. I didn't know you painted. Uh, I did them a long time ago. After I got out of the army. You don't paint anymore? I don't have time for that anymore. What's with you on the phones? What are you scared of? I'm not scared. <laughs> Lou... You just wouldn't understand. Uh, don't, don't start telling me about the class of 46. That doesn't mean I'm made of stone. I want you to talk to me. I'm not sure I can. I've never told anyone. I thought you were going to talk to someone at the VA. Well, I didn't. Why not? I didn't want to take time away from some guy I might really need it. And you don't, huh? Why don't you try me? It's a long story, Lou. I don't have to go to work till nine and one morning. This phone business goes back to Nam, early 71. You know about Aunt Kay? Yeah, I think so. What about it? I was there with a combat photographic team probing with an intelligence unit. Worked with a guy named Sam. We worked uh, two-man teams. One acted as sort of an assistant. Sam was... Older, uh, he had a bad back. Shouldn't have been there. What happened? One day we were out. There were sounds of a firefight up ahead. Small arms, mostly. I didn't think I had enough film with me. I sent Sam back to the Jeep to get the other bag. He'd taken about ten steps when there was this loud rushing found myself on the ground. And when I lifted up and looked around, Sam was dying. Anti-personnel mine? 
I got up and stumbled over to where he was, and he was in a terrible way. He kept saying, shoot me. I just stood there, staring at what he'd become. All the while, he was begging me to finish him. Some guys behind us came up, and I heard an M16 blip off half a clip. And there was this kid throwing up after he did it. I'm sorry I pushed you into this. Look, if you don't want to go on... About a year and a half after I got out, these calls began. The phone would ring. A woman's voice would say, this is Edith, Sam's wife. She'd say, I know you killed Sam. She'd say, I think about him all the time, but I want you to think about him too, Dennis. And then she'd hang up. I'd move, and the calls would stop for about three months, and they'd start again. I don't know how she found me changed my number same thing had happened till i came down here with the trip for a long time i never heard from her till about three weeks ago same thing this is edith dennis i'm still thinking about sam i miss him i want you to think about sam do you dennis do you <sighs> oh god Lou. as if i needed her to make me think of sam if I hadn't sent him back for that film. Oh, I think of him, Lou. I would think of him without the calls. Well, I don't know what to do about it. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. No, I do not believe that the Vietnam vet is any different than any other veteran. Except maybe more of a crybaby. Now, that is not an official statement. That is my private opinion. I was in 101st in Germany, and I mean, we had suicides in that war because nobody knew when it was going to end. And you don't think the Vietnam vets had it as well? In World War II and in Korea, it was the duration plus six months. <laughs> I'll take that history in Vietnam anytime. I mean, all they had to do was put in there 12 months, wrap it up, and go home. See, the only reminder of the Vietnam War is the Vietnam veteran. And nobody wants that kind of reminder, not for that war. So in their eagerness to reject the war, they reject the vet, too. Exactly. I mean, I don't know anybody who goes around telling people he was a NAM that he's a vet. Well, what would you say is the biggest problem with a veteran today? He doesn't take advantage of what's being offered to him. He has the GI Bill, and here we sit by law trying to help and wanting to help. And they just don't bother to come in. Why do you think that is? Do you feel hostile toward them? Well, it's not their fault. They're a bureaucracy. But to our guys, it's wait your turn, stand in line, it's the army. I know that they're on the staff, and the staff they do have, they're good guys, but let's face it, most of them are World War II vets. Uh, they don't understand these country guys like us come in, beards, long hair, and don't really know what's the matter with them. On the other hand, these things take time. And the guy who's head of the VA is a disabled Vietnam vet himself. Is there such a thing as post-Vietnam syndrome? Nah, of course. There seems to be some disagreement on that point. In World War II, we didn't have any fancy names for it. We called it battle fatigue. No, excuse me, Jack. It's not the same thing. This is a delayed stress reaction. It shows up in a lot of different ways. Depression, aggression, a lot of things. I mean, it could take 10 years before it shows up in some veterans. Some doctors say that it gets worse. So that by 1980, about 50% of the guys who came back from NAM will be affected. The biggest problem is unemployment. Let's face it, a lot of these guys couldn't find jobs before they went in. I mean, these are guys who society had written off to begin with. And I can tell you this for a fact, that they lowered the Army entrance requirements at one point, what they call the AFQT scores. Doesn't that happen in most wars? Not like this. We're talking about an average score of 68. At one point in Vietnam, things got so bad they started letting in the tens. That's incredible. Well, it's either that or start hitting the colleges. Guess which way they went. And of course, there's the problem of bad paper now, which just compounds the whole thing. Bad paper? Undesirable discharge. You see, they have dishonorable discharge, DD. Now, that takes a court martial. And then there's a undesirable discharge, UD. They started handing out UDs like cookies. 
just to punish guys they thought were out of line. So now, the employer doesn't want you in the first place, because maybe you're a minority. In the second place, because you're a veteran. In the third place, because you got bad paper. Well, what's the answer? Are things going to get better? I certainly hope so. That's what we're here for. Well, maybe if people knew what was going on, they'd care. A lot of it is up to the man himself. I doubt things will get better. I'm trying to get you a job. Well, I can tell you something right now. I can guarantee you, your newspaper ain't gonna hire me. What makes you so sure? For one thing, I've got what they call bad paper. How'd you get it? Don't matter. If it didn't matter, I wouldn't ask you. Look, I could tell you my side of it, but the paper says something different. I got it like a lot of guys got it. I come off the line with two months to go, and I run into this strutty little second lieutenant who didn't like the way I shined my shoes. After what I'd just been through, I wasn't ready for that. One thing led to another, and I was in trouble. And they're saying, you know, since you've seen all that action, we're going to make it easy on you. We're not going to court-martial you. We'll let you sign a Chapter 10. Undesirable discharge. You got it. To this day, I wish I'd fought them on it, made them court-martial me. I'd have won. And then I'd really have something going for me now. Certainly. Other guys who are over there, bad paper or not, have come back and made a life for themselves. Most of them. Yeah, but what about the ones who couldn't? Up on the line, had grunts alongside me. Kids who were so helpless they couldn't even tie their own shoelaces. Show me a man who's been through that hell. I don't care how whole he looks or how whole he acts. Scratch him a little bit and see. His blood is going to run green from the stink of that war. Something that was five years ago. You have to let that go. Don't you know? Ain't you guessed by now? Ain't none of us ever left the Nam. We're still there. And it's just what this country wants. In over five years, ain't no one ever come up to me and said, you did a good job. We didn't like that war, but we appreciate what you did. We appreciate that you tried. We're caught in a bad middle, Mr. Grant old generation, they're down on us because we didn't win. And because they say we're dopers and freaks. And the young people who should be our brothers, they're down on us too. Calling us baby burners and women killers. It's what you call a no-win situation. For me, those years in the Army were great days. I know it sounds crazy to say it. It was a horrible time for the world. Weren't you in Germany? Yeah, Hamburg. I was in the service for eight days, and then they signed the armistice, so I spent two years as a disc jockey. Didn't you see any action? Yeah, I saw a lot of action. But not the kind you're thinking. Ta -da 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 -da. Those were good times after the war. 47, 48. Going to Cornell, courtesy of Uncle Sam. Sure, we ate spaghetti five nights a week, but I never would have gotten to college if I hadn't been in the Army. That's why I'm here today. Oh, I thought you were here because the times let you go. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't be here if you added a pen on the post-Vietnam GI Bill. Yeah, you, you covered that in this piece. Why, well, this current bill, for crying out, doesn't pay tuition. The allowance that can't go anywhere near as far as the one that we have. Well, who needs college now when the Army itself trains you for a career? How'd you hear that? I've seen the ads. They have some great programs. Had them right through Vietnam. Somehow it didn't work out that way for an awful lot of these veterans. In fact, a kind of cool thing happened. These guys, who had never had a chance to handle responsibility at home, got over there and suddenly found themselves made squad leaders in positions of command. When they got back here, they were just a bunch of unemployables. A guy who'd had a dozen men under him over there couldn't understand why all he had offered to him over here was a chance to push a broom. Yeah, you know, that's true, Lou, and it's a, it's a rotten thing, but um, isn't that what happens in any war? Yeah, that's what I don't understand. War is a war. It's these vets who are acting so different. Vietnam was different. Adam, you were in Vietnam? Yeah. Well, you never told me. Nothing to tell. A reporter or in combat? Combat. 
Well, uh, doesn't your being here belie everything and lose series? I mean, here you are, successful at a young age and uh, editor on a good newspaper. Yeah, I'm here. Maybe someday I'll tell you how close I came to being one of those guys. I feel like I know all of them. It's a good series, Lou. Thanks. How about that one? I thought you got one when he turned around, right after the speech. Oh, when the heckler started. Right, that's the one I told Lou about. It's the only one that'll work with my lead. It's perfect. I didn't get it. You just told me you had it. No, no. You said I had it. I'm sorry, I don't. Your phone's ringing. Yeah, I know. Aren't you gonna answer it? I got my hands full. Unfill them. Are you kidding? What do you care if I answer a phone? How do you know? Hey, all your friends know. We just wish we could help you. Well, thank everybody for me, but uh, tell them they can't. Come on, Animal, pick it up. You don't understand. No, I don't. All I do know is I've seen a guy I've worked with for two years who's not afraid of anything, suddenly afraid to pick up a phone. Can anything she says be worse than what you're going through? Yes. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. Well, now, Mr. Sutton. Yes, I see, Sutton. It doesn't say on your application what position you're applying for. Well, I thought editor, movie critic. Oh, have you reviewed films? No, but I've seen a mess of them. My friends ask me what I think. They tell me I'm really right on. I see. Look, you tell me what you got, and I'll tell you if I can do it. Well, I'm uh, afraid it doesn't exactly work that way. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's start with your last job. That was... A uh, gardener. Gardener? I work with plants in a garden. I see. Well, what about before your employment as a gardener? Just odd job. I was sort of looking for the right thing. I haven't connected. Well, maybe we can uh, get a clue here. Uh, you were in the Army, I see? That's right. You got my discharge papers right there. Yes, I see. I'm looking at them right now. I can tell by your face you're looking at them right now. I'm not sure I know what you mean. But, uh, let's see. You were discharged? That's right. I was discharged. Your Army career was not what one would call completely successful, was it? Look, you saw my number right there. You saw my spin number. Yeah, I've got bad paper. Naturally, we seek out the best qualified people. And we try to take into consideration all factors. And uh, the fact that you had a problem in the Army... Bothers you some, right? Well, what I'm trying to say is that... Naturally, we don't discriminate against anyone for something that may have happened when they were younger. But... But what? I think we have a good picture now, Mr. Sutton. Maybe we should keep your application on file, and if there's an opening I think you're qualified for, we'll be in touch. Look, I tried real hard not to come in here with a chip on my shoulder, but to look on your face when you saw my spin number. Oh, hell, why do I bother? I got talked into this one. I should have known. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Got a minute? Sure, Errol. What's up? I just wanted to tell you I cleared it with Rasmus and I'm going to be taking some time off. Oh. Well, I guess you haven't had a vacation in a while. Where are you going? I thought I'd go up to Seattle, see my folks. Ah. Check in with a couple of friends, maybe do a little backpacking. Sounds nice. You're not coming back, are you? Sure. I haven't made up my mind yet. Actually, I got a couple offers. Uh, one from the New Weekly in St. Louis. They're going to be trying some interesting things. Work with color a lot. Never been to St. Louis. What are you going to do when she finds you in St. Louis? 
That's not really your problem, is it, Lou? I don't know. I don't know where your problem ends and my problem begins. I'll send you a picture postcard from the arch. Hey, Arnold. It's not your fault that your buddy got killed. I know you know that in your head, and I guess it's hard for you to feel it. I can't. How is that woman ever going to forgive you if you don't forgive yourself? If you need forgiving, huh? You've got to find a way to let that wound heal, or it's going to kill you. You left a lot of bodies over there. Don't you be another casualty of that war. Hey, Sutton, how are you? Well, I don't know how I am, to tell you the truth. I went up and saw your personnel man, Mr. Dangler. Very nice, very polite. Yesterday, I know. How'd it go? Well, I don't think I was exactly what the Los Angeles Tribune had in mind. What do you mean, you didn't get the job? Well, neither one of us really thought that was going to happen, did we? Hey, wait a minute, Sutton. Hello, Sutton. I'm here, my man. Look, I want to... Thank you for taking a shot at it. Hello? Hello? Sutton? There was no place to slot him. I didn't send him to you to get slaughtered. I sent him to you because he needed a job, and by God, he deserves a job. Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Grant, is that why you asked for this meeting? So you could badger Mr. Dangler? Mrs. Pinchon, does this paper have a policy for hiring vets? I don't know. Do we? A policy is to hire the most qualified man for the job. That seems a logical rule of thumb to me, don't you agree? Maybe this is a situation where logic isn't the answer. That's nonsense. Well, if I came to you and asked you to hire a man as a reporter and he wasn't qualified, you wouldn't hire him. And I'd respect you for it. Well, my job is to screen applicants, Mr. Grant. This isn't charity. This is taking a second look at a man who's been through that terrible war. Not look away, hoping he'll disappear. Now that is extreme. Mr. Dangler's not taking that position at all. Huh? Of course. I, I don't make a point of discriminating against Vietnam veterans. And, and just because he's a vet doesn't mean that we should give him preferential treatment. I think we should. I think it's time we welcome them back home. I think it's time we told them we don't blame them for what happened. Mr. Dangler, perhaps you can talk to the young gentleman again. Well, of course I will, but... Well, you've got to understand my problems. I've got all these pressures, minorities, women. Well, we have one of those. I'll do whatever you want, Mrs. Pinchon. And you'll hire him. If we can find something? Do find something, Mr. Dangler. I'll do my best. Mr. Dangler, thank you for understanding. But I'm not understanding. I'm just trying to keep my job. Well, I think he's got himself a shot. Great. City room, Billy Newman. Uh, just a moment, please. Animal? Telephone. Are you in? What line is it on? 98. Sam all the time, too. 
I never had a chance to tell you. He, he was my friend. Will you, will you just listen for a second, please? I, I, I want to talk to you now. I'd like to explain this to you. I want to meet you. Can't we do that? Hello? Hello, are you still there? Edith. Oh. Are you crying? Listen, listen. I have a new home phone number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll be there tonight. I'll, I'll wait for your call. You got a pencil? City desk, Donovan. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Lou, there's a fire in West Hollywood, just uh, north of Santa Monica Boulevard. Looks like it might turn into a bad one. Shall I send Rosenthal? Sure, send Rosenthal. Now, the penny to beat is right there, dude. That one right there. I'll beat it with my eyes. Come on, though. this ain't no turkey <laughs> shoot. Not yet. Hey, that's, that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess I'll uh, uh, <laughs> All the pins, I have all the pins, of course. Uh, uh, Give me my two cents, man. Get out of here. You ain't getting nothing here, man. What's wrong with you? Afternoon. Sure yeah. is. Say, there was a guy hanging out with you last week, a fellow named Sutton. You know him. Uh, yeah, we know him. Used to be with uh, three foot first, I think. Well, I've kind of lost track of him. Uh, I'm trying to get a message to him. Oh, you the man with the job. Really, wasn't no job. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, uh, I wonder if you know where he is. Uh, I mean, uh, have you seen him? I haven't seen him for a while now. I don't know where he is. Do you have any idea where he's going? No, I ain't seen him for two, three days. He's coming around here pretty regular. Must have moved on. I was just wondering. Yeah, well, hey, we see him. We tell him. Yeah. Huh? We tell him, man. <laughs> Thanks. Sure, your dog's cute, but can he save your life? We'll see some super pups in action on dogs at a and special presentation Sunday. Now, an ex-cop seeks revenge against the men who crippled him on Police Story, next on A&E. I'd like to confirm. Hey, I've been getting the run around for two hours. I'm well, coming over. Approximately how much money was missing? Was it was called in that tank truck collision on the Harbor Freeway? I swung it over to Sam. Okay. The driver had a blood alcohol of one six. Poor guy probably didn't even know he's dead. <laughs> It'll hit him in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Have a good night. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I'll be right down. If you read it now, I can stay late and fix it, assuming there's anything wrong with it. I can't, Rossi. I'll do it first thing in the morning. This is the first installment of my series on the city council members. I don't know. I think it's the best thing I've done in months. Mm. Haven't you been looking forward to this? Of course. I thought of nothing else. But my son-in-law's in town. He's taking me out to dinner tonight. Oh, that's nice, Lou. Look, mm -hmm. you can read it before he gets here. It reads really fast. Only 3,000 words. Uh, the front desk just called me, Rossi. He's waiting downstairs. Oh, Lou. Uh, he told me he had a big surprise for me, and I love surprises. That's why I want to save your story till the morning. He made reservations at a nice little French place. Uh, 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 uh. Huh. You think it'll be dark there? Why? Because if it isn't, you could read it while I wait at the bar. Yeah. <sighs> Anything else, miss you? Uh, not for me. You? I'm fine. We would like the musician to come over, though. Of course. What? Your reflexes are going low. Oh. Uh, Must be your age. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe playing for two guys makes him nervous. <laughs> we'll just have to do it without music. 
Is it time for the surprise? What is it? Another grandchild? No, Sarah would have told me that. You move in L.A. No, she would have told me that, too. All right, I give up. Remember all that money you loaned me, Lou? I never loaned you any money. When I first got out of college and the baby came faster than we planned. That wasn't a loan, it was a gift. Do you know how much it eventually added up to altogether? I don't want to know. Through those early years, Lou, you loaned me $5,246.80. You just bought me dinner, so that makes us even. That much? I kept very close track of that money, Lou. And I want to pay you back now. With interest. Oh, come on, Larry. That's a check for $15,000. Hey, I've done very well. I'll say. Thanks anyway, but you keep it, Larry. No. I thought you'd do that. Let's see you tear this up, Lou. I suggest you donate all the money to the Civic Light Opera, Mr. Grant. Yes. That's very high on my list, Mrs. Pinjohn. It's right after hiring a plane and sprinkling it over Griffith Park. <laughs> you have never seen a really good production of Pirates of Penzance, have you? I've never even seen a bad one. You know, $15,000 is quite a windfall. Do something outrageous with it. Something you never would have dreamed of doing. Well, we're back to light opera again. Now, I'm serious. You know, I've had money all my life. It's not what it's cracked up to be. It doesn't buy you friends or love or keep you from being ill. But if you use it correctly, it can provide some very amusing interludes. You know, Lou, 15 grand is no fortune, but if it's handled right, it can really take care of you a few years down the line. You mean in my twilight years? Exactly. What do you suggest, Charlie? One hand of poker, five card draw. My place, my deck of cards. For you. Seriously, I know the best investment man in town. Maybe you should meet him. Do they I need to? Well, he's not only sound, he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's been managing my money for five years. Guy's a genius. People who handle other people's money are seldom geniuses. Picasso was a genius. Vladimir Horowitz is a genius. All right. Let Vladimir Horowitz invest your money for you, then. You'd probably give it to the Civic Light Opera. <laughs> hey, look, as it turns out, he and I are having a kind of business dinner at my house tonight. Why don't you come, too? Oh, I, I don't want to intrude, Charlie. Marion's making her chicken pot pie. 7.30 good? Of course, they don't all work out as well as the London deal. Some of David's investments only return 11%. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie and I have been pretty lucky together. I don't know if it's me or you, Charlie. David, I hope you won't be insulted, but money talk makes me nervous. I'm going in the kitchen and retile the floor. Yeah, Marion doesn't approve of my high-yield investments. She'd be very happy if we put all of our money into an old sock. Hmm? Isn't that right, honey? No. Under the mattress would be... <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, explain your new financial situation to me, Lou. Oh, but to tell you the truth, I don't think I'm the right person for you. Uh, I hope you won't be offended if I say that right now what you have is too small a unit to invest. 15,000 is small? Sounds terrible, doesn't it? I'm really sorry. You know, I have to admit, David, I'm a little bit disappointed. Well, I'd be glad to help Lou out however I can. Uh, as a favor, of course. Uh, maybe not so much with investments, but with planning. What do you mean? Mm, little things you might have overlooked. For example, who is the beneficiary on your GI life insurance? How'd you know I was in the Army? Are you kidding? <sighs> uh, my beneficiary, uh, my wife. My, my ex-wife now. Yeah. Guys get divorced, they forget to change their beneficiary. It happens all the time. I'll send you the form so you can change it. Thank you. Also, you probably don't have an up-to-date will, right? I can do that for you, too. You know, I don't mean to sound ungracious, David, but anybody can do that for Lou. 
I mean, here you are, a, a, a genius at investments, and you won't let my very best friend in on anything good. I, I find that very upsetting. Hey, Charlie. Why, you know, it's sure, it's, it's only $15,000 now, but you could turn that into a very handsome amount by the time Lou retires. Charlie, it's okay. Look, Charlie, if it means that much to you, I will see what I can do. I'll try and figure out some way to accommodate Lou. Maybe I can fractionalize one of the deals. I see. Why are you thanking him? It's my money. <laughs> This is not just a motor car, you know. It's not? No, sir. What else is it? It's a way of life. That's so. Have you uh, owned one of these motor cars before? No. But I've seen them around. And you've always wanted one. It's kind of a fantasy thing, you know. Indeed. Anyway, I've um, fell into a few dollars quite unexpectedly, so I thought I'd at least take a look. And why not? Listen, just how much is this motor car? $45,000. <laughs> I want out, David, and I want out now. Out of the Houston deal? Out of everything, and I want all my money back. I'm not sure I can let you do that, Richard, for your own good. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Richard, you're a doctor, a specialist in your field. I wouldn't presume to come into your office and tell you your business. I'm a specialist in my field. You're a crook, well-dressed and in a fancy office. But you're a crook just the same as a guy who goes out and robs a liquor store. And I'm going to make sure that people know about that, too. Charlie Hume on line three, David. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Uh, no, I haven't found anything for Lou yet. But I'm keeping my eyes open, old buddy. <laughs> okay. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. six pieces of bread at one time. Oh, great. I could toast bread for the whole week and freeze it. It's got nine dial settings, everything from super light to burnt. Must be the deluxe model. I like a piece of toast in the morning. Why don't you buy it? 75 bucks. 75 bucks? For a toaster? Hey, Lou, it's not just a toaster. I know. It's a way of life. decide what to get me for Christmas, huh? I'm trying to make up a list of the things I always wanted and never got. Things that maybe I'd want to get now with the money, you know? Electric trains, sled. Yeah, well, I figured I'd start with the things I wanted as a kid, work my way up. Box of 64 crayons. Uh, oh, oh, that one was only because Laurie Obler had them. I probably don't need them now. Mel Ott autographed baseball glove. Mel Ott. Outfielder with the old New York Giants. Yeah, he used to uh, lift his right leg when he'd hit. Very graceful. I don't think I could live without that glove. It's funny, isn't it? When you're young, there are so many things you want, things you gotta have or you'll die. I was always saving for something or wishing for something. 
I guess you'll grow it. Not me. I still want a baseball mitt. Lou? Mm -hmm. uh, look, I know a lot of people are giving you financial advice. Ah, you probably don't want to hear any more. No, no. What do you got? I know a guy. Really sharp. Really plays the angles. You know what he does? Mm -hmm. He doesn't keep all his money in a checking account. When it gets to a certain amount, he slides it over to savings. See, because they don't pay interest on the checking accounts. Like he says, keep your money working for you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Can I help you, sir? I was looking for the financial editor. Well, that's Adam Wilson, but I think he's gone for the day. Oh. I'm the city editor. Maybe I can help you. Well, I don't want to wait. Maybe you can. Okay. I'm listening. I'm Dr. Barnes, Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant? Over the past five years, I've invested almost $200,000 with someone I'm convinced is a con man. I think he's involved in one of the largest investment frauds this state has ever seen. You have proof? I'm putting it together. I can show you everything I have now, if you're interested. What's this guy's name? David Milburn. I'm interested. How long were you and Milburn in business together? About five years. Started with a modest real estate investment. Turned out rather well, and then another, and another. Pretty soon I was putting everything I had into deals with Milburn. Doing well. Uh, every three months, nice quarterly dividend. But about a year ago, the dividends began arriving a little late. Seven months ago, the dividends stopped. And you went to Milburn and asked for your money back, and he said no. David Milburn isn't so foolish as to use words like yes or no. Now, what he did was to show me a lot of graphs, a lot of charts, a lot of bank statements, all of which indicated my investments would be peaking within six months. I'd be an idiot to want to pull my money out at that time. I left Milburn's office feeling very lucky to have him on my side. Then how can you be so certain that he's a fraud? Last week I was in London at a medical convention. While I was there, I decided to take a look at some of the properties Milburn and I had purchased. One building in particular, right on Parliament Square. Here's the only building at that address. Westminster Abbey. I didn't even know it was for sale. Oh, come on, Lou. David Milburn, a crook? I'm just telling you what Dr. Barnes told me. But, Lou, I don't know your Dr. Barnes, but I do know David Milburn. Dr. Barnes didn't set up a trust fund for my daughter, Joni. David Milburn did. Dr. Barnes didn't turn my modest little investment into a six-figure nest egg. David Milburn did. Barnes has no reason to lie to me, Charlie. Hello. I have got certificates of deposit, bonds, a passbook, a five-year record of prosperity. I'm not going to throw that out the window because some fellow I don't even know is yelling foul. Why don't you at least talk to Milburn? And say what? That I heard he's a crook? Exactly. Oh. Wow. Come on. Dick Barnes has a right to be angry. He lost a hell of a lot of money. I don't enjoy being called a crook, of course, but what can I say? If I try to defend myself, I'm afraid I'm giving credence to all that nonsense. What happened to Barnes' money, David? It went right down the tubes, Charlie. I can't believe the run of bad luck we had. You know, I had some of my own money invested. Not as much as Dick, but enough to hurt. But he said that he asked you for it back before it went down the tubes. And I wish to God I could have given it to him. But most of the money was in a West Indian bank that got into some problems. There was a serious run on the bank, and they would no longer honor requests for withdrawals. The only way to get money out of there would have been to steal it. Maybe I should have given that a shot. Sorry to be bringing this up. I just thought the best thing was to be, you know, up front with these rumors. People like Dr. Barnes forget one important thing about investing. In order for me to do better than a bank can do, I have to take certain risks. And not every deal for every person has worked out. It's just one of those things. 
There is one other thing that I, I have to mention. Barnes said that... Uh, <laughs> he said that you never actually bought the property that you claimed that you bought with his money. Now, that really makes me mad. I don't mind so much a guy being angry. Hell, he's got a right to be angry. But to spread vicious accusations. I'm only repeating what he said. Listen, Charlie. If there is any doubt in your mind, I will get all your money back to you right now. I'll... I'll sign my house over to you. You can put it in your safety deposit box. No, that, that's, that's really not necessary. I mean it. I mean it. I will take you down to my bank right now. Look, David, I trust you. I always have. I'm just sorry to be bringing all this up. It's all right. Let's get Burroughs downtown to cover Garber's conference. He's been doing a great job since we switched him over. And make sure Rosenthal knows that we aren't satisfied with the way he's handling the mayor's office. Something wrong? No. Rossi City Council piece was excellent. Board of Supervisors is a natural. What's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. D don't tell me nothing. Why do you keep staring at me like that? I was just wondering, now that you got a few bucks, if you were going to start dressing a little, um... Well, a little... Better? Not necessarily better, but, uh, different. Which would be better? It's just that there are so many other colors for shirts now, besides white. Thanks. Now, if you're through with my wardrobe, I'd like to get back to work. Can I speak to Lou alone for a second, Art? Sure. If it's about his shirts, I already told him. Did you meet with Milburn? Yeah, I met with him. Well? You know, nailing a guy when you have the goods on him, that's one thing. But to spread unfounded gossip, that's irresponsible. You confronted him with Barnes' evidence? Here's the evidence, Lou. These are copies of stock certificates, real estate holdings, bank deposits. Feel those, Lou. Go ahead, feel them. That has weight. They're real. They're not the nebulous ravings of a frustrated loser. Barnes gave me a lot of material, Charlie. I'm still sifting through it. Well, while you're sifting through it, Lou, think about this. You just made me feel like an ingrate to a man who's been nothing but a friend to me. It was embarrassing. I don't want to hear any more about it or about your Dr. Barnes. Okay. Okay. Sorry I'm late. That's okay. What's up, Lou? Any rumors about Milburn reach your desk, Adam? There are always rumors, Lou. That's what keeps the market looking like a roller coaster. But nothing's gone past the rumor stage yet. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Barnes is just someone who speculated and lost, and he's trying to hang the other guy because he lost $200,000. Yeah, some people are funny that way. Well, we've got a lot of material here to look over. We should speak to the people involved, check out the properties, the partnerships. This is very complicated. Whatever happened to putting your money in a Christmas club? Why, well, have Christmas once a year when you can have it every day? Billy, I want you to talk to this lawyer, Patrick Terhune. He's a specialist in this type of fraud. Okay. Now, he's a colorful old guy. He's in his 70s. Still something of a ladies' man. I'll watch my step. Rossi, you run down some background on Milburn. Prior deal. See if there are any problems in the past. Okay. And Adam, see if you can put this stuff into words that we can understand. Give me everything you have on Milburn. That's easy. There's lots of stuff on him. I'll pull the clips. I'm going to see Dr. Barnes at home tonight. I'd like to clear this up as soon as possible. What's the hurry? Personal. Still looking for some place to put your money, huh? I'm glad I could convince you to come, Mr. Grant. If you've got any hard evidence, I want to see it. You won't be disappointed. Uh, I'm not so sure. Milburn didn't have any trouble making a believer out of Charlie Hume. <laughs> I'm not surprised he sidestepped your friend. If you want to call it that. He said it was just sour grapes with you. Nothing illegal, just some hard luck. <laughs> That's so? Mm-hmm. It's a convincing argument, Dr. Barnes. I've been calling around, Mr. Grant, to the other doctors who invested with Milburn. 
I'm not the only one who was taken in this fraud. A rather large bunch of sour grapes, wouldn't you say, Mr. Grant? Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on A&E. Has Lou decided yet what he wants to do with his money? No. He's keeping his options open. You know how it is with single guys. You know, I saw David Milburn yesterday. Uh, what did you buy now? Krugerons? Yen? General Motors? Uh, Lou had some cockeyed information about David being involved in some big banking fraud. And? It's just nonsense. Are you sure? Honey, David offered to sign over his house as security for the money we have with him. I hope you let him. Barry, and... I know. I'm sorry, Charlie. We, we've gone through this enough already. Let's not go around one more time. You'll never trust him, will you? I don't trust any of them, Charlie. I like a bank or savings and loan where it's insured, safe, nothing flashy. And where your money earns five and three quarter percent and inflation is 12%. It's a losing battle, honey. That's why we took out the second mortgage on the house in February. I thought it was your bonus money you gave him. Well, I gave him that, too. In other words, uh, everything we have is tied up with Milburn? No, honey. Not tied up. Tied up is a loaded phrase. I can get my money from him any time I want. Well... Milburn's a crook, all right, Miss Newman. There's no doubt about it. And it'll all come out very shortly. Why haven't you sued him? I've been a lawyer for 50 years. I used to joke that Abe Lincoln and I were classmates. Not true. I knew Abe, but we weren't classmates. I guess all that experience is why the doctors chose you to go after Milburn. Did I tell you how I went after Barton Kreisel in a security fund scandal? Twice. Just wanted to make sure you were listening. Could we get back to the Milburn case? Oh, I've got more stories. I'm sure. Maybe I could tell you over dinner some night. Oh, well. Hmm. Uh, okay, let's get back to David Milburn. Now, where were we? Ah. Oh. In the beginning, Milburn made a lot of money for his investors, right? Well, he must have been doing something clever, or else how could he get all the money to pay those fabulous dividends? He gets the money from other investors. You see, it's the old Ponzi scheme. He can keep paying off, not because his investments are doing well. Actually, there are very few investments. He uses new money from new people to pay dividends to his previous clients. And so on down the line until now, where it's all collapsing from its own weight. And how does Milburn make money, then? He takes a percentage off the top of every deal he makes. First of all, there's his fee for being a general partner. Secondly, he takes an advisory fee then a property management fee on each transaction. He takes some cream off the top of every dollar that comes in, which isn't bad when you consider there's really any money actually invested. Just shuffled. Exactly. Why isn't he in jail? Well, if I have anything to say about it, that's where he'll end up. Now, did I tell you I got the indictment against the Todd Kralin outfit in that El Dorado oil swindle? I think you did. You know, I can't understand how people can be so gullible. David Milburn takes advantage of that little bit of greed in all of us. He had everybody tripping all over themselves to give him every dime they had or could borrow. You know, I'm responsible for half the legislation written in this state on investment fraud. Free for lunch sometime? I don't understand, Adam. All these articles on Milburn make him out to be a genius. Well, a lot of these are just feeds from Milburn's office. Now, why'd you print them? Don't we usually charge people to put ads in the paper? Well, David Milburn's very highly thought of in financial circles. What he did was news. I dug up something new on Milburn. It seems he was indicted in Kansas City and St. Louis for improprieties. Got probation by agreeing to make restitution, which he did. How much money was involved? About half a million bucks. And he only got probation? Evidently, he was surprised to get that. They say he had some very big connections right up to the state house. Thought he was immune. I don't understand how we could pull the wool over everybody's eyes like that. Well, look, suppose you invested money with someone 
and every three months you received a dividend of, say, 10%. Meanwhile, thinking that this was completely safe and tax-sheltered, would you be happy? I guess so. And you'd tell your friends? My good friends, sure. If it was such a good product, why it fail? Milburn became obsessed with the high lifestyle, the high rolling, the action. He got into trouble with a few buildings that were losing money. In order to keep paying those dividends, he had to expand. At one point, he had a negative cash flow of $100,000 a month. In other words, each month he was taking in $100,000 less than he was paying out? He had to turn that around any way he could. I don't think he started out to be a crook. But it sure looks like that's how he ended up. Didn't anybody ever check? Sure. The Kansas City deal involved a shopping center out here in Gardena. It was called the Eden Mall. The investor sent a guy out here to check it out. Milburn met him at the airport with a limousine stocked with your favorite brand of hookers. By the time this guy got back to Kansas City, he could hardly walk. They sent him out here to take a look at Eden. He found paradise, huh? Hallelujah. <laughs> the dollar's up a little. You mean it may be worth a dollar again? I wouldn't go that far, but it's showing a lot of strength against the Polish Zloty. Say, that's good news for you, isn't it, Lou? I mean, being a wealthy tycoon and all? The rich get richer. That's always the way. All right, all right. I've taken enough kidding already. Give me a break. What are you going to do with all that money, Lou? I don't know yet. So far, I've bought a shirt and a toaster. If I was a young single guy, I'd know what to do with it. Hey, if I was a young single guy, I'd know what to do with it. You're the financial editor, Adam. Why don't you give Lou some advice? Go to Vegas, Lou. Put it all on black. Is not a little conservative? All right, red. Go on a cruise? I'd spend it on a woman. That's good. Buy things for a woman. No, no. I meant I'd buy a woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Joe. Can't go wrong buying yen, Lou. Mm. Or antique furniture. Mm. Just don't give it to David Milburn. What's that supposed to be? Nothing. I wouldn't call it nothing. You heard of Milburn, Charlie? Yeah, I heard of him. Lou's dug up some stuff on Milburn that'll knock your socks off. When's that gonna be ready, Lou? Uh, well, I don't know. You just won't get off it, will you, Lou? A lot of unanswered questions, Charlie. What is it gonna take? You need to see blood? Come on, Charlie. You're damaging this man's reputation with innuendo and hearsay. I'm not so sure. I think it's more than that. And I'm not the only one. Milburn's being sued by Barnes. Okay, come with me. Let's get this out of your system once and for all. You act as if I want David Milburn to be a crook. I just want to put this thing to rest. Good, me too. Just promise me one thing. What's that? When this is settled, you'll apologize to David. Believe me, Charlie, that will be my pleasure. Maybe he moved to a bigger office. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on a and &E. I've got substantiation, Charlie, but just from one source, and I'm not that confident of him. Have you talked to Lou? He said you might know somebody over at Midwest Fidelity and could help me. Not now, Billy. there's any truth to the rumor that there are two Charlie Humes? You mean Charlie Hume and the strange guy that just walked in that door? Lately, I haven't been able to get him to give me the time of day. He's going through a rough period, spending a lot of time preparing for this Milburn case. Isn't Milburn about to be indicted? Thought he just turned himself in. He did. But Charlie's cooperating with the other investors. They're really trying to get him good. Maybe Charlie should take some time off, although I don't want to be the one to suggest it. That might not be a bad idea if he's under an awful lot of pressure. I can mention it to him, sort of casually. See what he says. Did you 
you get a chance to go over Burroughs' update on the busing story? No. Billy also needs a little help on the Midwest for See, he thinks we're not ready. He thinks we're going to lose interest. He thinks he's going to drag it out so we get off of the light sentence a year or two, maybe. But tomorrow at that hearing, he is in for one very big surprise. Good. Because we've got him. We have got him nailed. Our friend David's going to go to jail. Oh, he, he was smart, sure. But so are we. We banded together to pool our information. We've got every letter, every note, every lie documented three ways from Wednesday. He's in over his head, my friend. That's great, I guess. I gotta hand it to him, though. On paper, it all looks so good. Diversified, aggressive, but not speculative. Always a step or two ahead of the game. The man ate dinner at my house, Lou. He joked with my kids. You saw him. Take it easy, Charlie. Take it easy. I'm going to have to pay $300 a month for the next 10 years on money I borrowed to get on one of David's deals. That money was supposed to buy property in London. Instead, it's buried in a coffee can somewhere. Thinking yourself crazy isn't going to get it back? Well, I'm going to get it back, Lou. I'm going to get it back, or I'm going to get my pound of flesh. You're obsessed, Charlie. It's getting to you. It's affecting your work. Not up to your standards, Lou? I, I didn't mean it that way. I don't care how you meant it. I'm the managing editor of this paper. I'm the guy who brought you out here and got you your job. Where did you forget that? I didn't forget. Well, now, why don't you go do your job? Leave me alone so I can do mine. Sure, Charlie. Whatever you say. He doesn't feel he needs a rest. I've never seen a scam this large. 700 doctors lost over 20 million dollars. 700 doctors and one managing editor. 700 doctors. Can you imagine what that's going to do the cost of medical care in Los Angeles? Maybe we could raise the price of the paper, Mrs. Pinchon. If the doctors are taking this anything like Charlie is, I'd hate to have an operation scheduled for tomorrow. Hmm. Central Fidelity Bank, Cawthon College. First Pacific Trust Company. Well, Mr. Hume is certainly in very good company. It's like a who's who of suckers, isn't it? A total of $43 million unaccounted for. Oh, is there any chance that some of this cash can be recovered uh, from the sale of properties, for instance? It turns out that there wasn't that much property actually purchased. Most of the money just sort of disappeared. A lot of it went into a bank in the West Indies. Milburn had a banking charter there, accepted money, and issued phony certificates of deposit. But surely, when he comes to trial, Mr. Milburn can be forced to reveal where that money is. Not very likely, Mrs. Pinchon. Oh, come now, Mr. Grant. The threat of prison. I should think he'd be anxious to talk. Let's face it. The chances are slim that Milburn will do any hard time. He knows that. That's why he turned himself in. Traditionally, this type of fraud has not produced very stiff sentences. Strange, isn't it? A guy holds up a liquor store. He gets 20 bucks in 20 years. Milburn steals millions. He'll probably get probation and be forced to teach a night class in economics at the YMCA. Lou Grant will continue in a moment here on A&E. How long is it going to go on, Charlie? Huh? How long are you going to sit here night after night without saying a word to me? Going over those papers. You're tearing yourself apart. When is it going to end? When I get my money back. Every dime that crook took from me. He's going to jail. Isn't that enough? No. Oh, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Well, you were right about him, Marion. You must feel some satisfaction about that anyway. Of course I don't. Don't sit on it, Marion. Come on, tell me I'm a fool. You're dying to do that. That's not fair. I haven't said a word. Yeah, but you want to. Don't you want to say I told you so? Don't you want to say you screwed up, Charlie? Look, I can't live for the next 20 years with that hanging unsaid over my head. I'd rather you just told me now, okay? Okay. I don't know how to say it. We lost a lot of money, Marion. You realize that? Of course. We're going to have to sell a few things to pay off our debts. Do you realize that? Yes. 
Well, how do you feel about that? You feel happy? No, I don't feel happy. I feel... I don't know, confused. I know we've had a terrible loss. I know that. I worked for 30 years. And it's gone. We've been wiped out. You say wiped out. And yet when I look at you, you're still here. Your hair's a little thinner. But otherwise, you're still okay. I've still got you, Charlie. And so, uh, the loss of anything else seems somehow not that bad. It's something we can get over. Don't be a saint on me, Marion. The last thing I need right now is somebody who's perfect. Okay. Okay, Charlie. Just be honest with me. What's left? Well, we'll be able to keep the house. But the money, the money's all gone. I see. You know, I, I keep thinking maybe I deserved what I got. Maybe I was just too greedy, wouldn't listen to anybody. You thought you were doing the right thing. I feel so guilty. I let you down. Sorry. Shh, Charlie. How could I have been so stupid? Charlie, don't. I can understand you're regretting the loss, but no repentance, honey. We don't need it. I know it's sacrilege, but um, why don't we just say to hell with it? And to hell with David Milburn. Your mother always said I'd never amount to anything. Oh, Charlie, please. You're right. <laughs> to hell with it. Your Honor, I did not take a penny of anyone's money for my own use. I myself lost everything I had trying to salvage something from this unfortunate turn of events. I ask that you allow me to remain free. Free to go about the business of returning to these people all the money rightfully due them. In jail, I am no good to anyone. Free, I can make full and complete restitution and ask the chance to do so. Your Honor, I beg you to give me that chance. All right, you may stand down. Before I pass sentence, I would like to make a few remarks. This has been a very complicated case. The sheer numbers of people and dollars involved is enormous. I would like to thank the United States Attorney's Office for thorough documentation, which indicates to me that this type of crime is no longer taken lightly by the Department of Justice. Neither is it by this court. Mr. Milburn, in the final analysis, you have deceived people and lived lavishly on other people's money. Money which in many cases represented the accumulation of a lifetime's work. To allow you to remain free be a mockery of the law of this land. taken a long time, but I really do understand. What you think is important to me, Charlie? You don't want to know what I think. And when they gave him ten years, Milburn's face dropped to the floor. I'd say it was about nine years and ten months more than he expected. It's really a stiff sentence for white-collar fraud. Maybe it's the start of a new trend. You think he'll ever tell what happened to the money? No, he won't talk. He's got $40 million stashed somewhere. 
With time off for good behavior, he could be out of jail in four years. That's $10 million a year for sitting still. And then he picks up where he left off. I don't know. I still don't understand how someone could be so dumb to fall for a... I'm sorry. I forgot. That's okay, Ross. <laughs> Lou. <clears throat> Do you accept verbal apologies or should I write one out? Forget it. You know, I talked to a couple of the other guys who were swindled. Blind, raging obsession seems to be a kind of a common response. Also, recrimination. And there are quite a few divorces on the horizon. Everything Milburn touched turns sour, huh? Not quite. Turns out he made a lot of young nurses happy. What do you mean? Some of these doctors were having affairs with their nurses, you know. Mm. Well, they never leave their wives because their wives would get half of what everyone thought was a very large estate. Mm. Then when Milburn wiped them out, they figured, why not? Nothing left to lose, so they moved in with their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Behind every cloud, see? Hey, you never did get around telling me. What did you end up doing with your money? Oh. Well, I thought it over for a long time. And then I decided to buy a baseball team. the urge to go down there and talk to the players? I'm not the kind of owner that throws his weight around. I've got complete confidence in my manager and coaching staff and players. That's a new ball. Isn't somebody going to get that ball? Those balls are two fifty a piece. Did it's my ball. Touch it and you're in big trouble. Hey! That's my ball! It's an underground movement that's gaining momentum and members. Investigative Reports explores the deadly world of the new skinheads tonight. Now, he wanted the best for his family, but his salary just wasn't enough. A cop is caught moonlighting to finance his daughter's ice skating dreams on Police Story, next on A&A. &E.